Hello, this is Nick Cap, and I will be giving you the lecture for module number three. We are going to be looking at microbial taxonomy, chapters uh, three and chapters four, looking at molecular diversity. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a good time, and um, uh, let's keep up with me. I want to break this up into three sections, so I'm going to have three individual videos that I will be doing, and I'll try and keep these videos down to about uh, 20 minutes a piece if I can do that. And so for this first video, we're going to be looking at microbial taxonomy. And uh, uh, for the most part, we're going to be looking at taxonomy and the classification of microbes. That is, uh, how do microbes relate to, to one another? And the science of cl classification of organisms is basically what we call taxonomy. Um, and I, it would, through taxonomy, we hope to show the relationships among organisms. And it provides a, a universal identification of an organism uh, and so again, why do we care about these things? For the most part, microorganisms are these small rod, cocci, or spirilli-shaped organisms, and uh, there's not really a big difference on them. Uh, this is a picture here of Pneumocystis uh, gerovexi. Uh, this was thought to be a protozoan, but when it, we did the DNA analysis of it, we showed that it's uh, a fungus. And so why does this matter, whether an organism is classified as protozoan or fungus? Well, it, it matters a lot. If this organism is a uh, pathogen, then if it's more like a fungus, then our antifungal medicines are going to work a lot better on this particular pathogens than the uh, antiprotozoans. And so pneumocystis basically means um, that this organism has some type of an effect on the, on the lungs. And so, uh, again, if we looked at this and we thought it was a protozoan and we treated it like the protozoan, we may um, miss out on things. Uh, in this slide here, we're talking about phylogeny or systemics. Uh, phylogeny shows the evolutionary relationships and history among organisms. And so we as biologists, a way to kind of look at things, we're not just kind of classifying things which we tend to do in the Burgess Manual a lot, what we really want to do is that we know that organisms are related to one another because they share a common ancestor. And that's a classic example of what a biologist does. Uh, again, when we're looking at evolution, typically uh, in the past we would look at something uh, that we call a fossil record, and we can't necessarily do that with microorganisms because for the most part they don't have hard body parts. They really don't have a lot of different shapes, so we can't identify them. So most bacterial identification uses what we call ribosomal RNA, rRNA sequencing, or some other sequencing information in order to, uh, to compare them to one another. And uh, we'll get that when we talk about genetics, we'll talk about it a little bit, bit more. And so in the hierarchy, we were looking at evolutionary relationships. Again, all of life shares a common ancestors. Species are grouped. Uh, for the most part, when we talk about eukaryotes, we talk about species that uh, basically they have productive sex. They're able to produce an offspring. If they're able to have sex with one another and produce an offspring, they're the same uh, species. Okay. A typical hierarchy is on the right. And so we have the species. Uh, uh, Domain, kingdom, phylum, division, class, order, family, genus, species. And so there are a number of species together that make up a genus, a number of genus together that make up a family, a number of families together that make up an order. And so, again, we're going to be looking at these times. The kingdom system was developed in 1969s in the domains. Uh, once we started getting genetic sequencing information was put in there, and so I, I had my cursor move around in, or, in order to do that. Uh, again, we can look at something like a dog or a plant, uh, these are all in the domain Eukarya. Uh, animalia is the plant. We have Chordata, Mammalian, uh, Carnivora is the, is the order. And so again, we have this uh, labeling of what we can kind of put those together. And so a dog is related to, let's say, us human beings because they're a mammal, but their order is a little bit different than our order. Kind of the same thing with, with, uh, with the plants as well. And we look at Carl's Five Wolves, as, as we consider these uh, very different. However, when we really look at life, getting more tools in the 1980s, what we're able to find is that life has these kind of three large domains where we put things in. So we have the eukarya, and these includes plants, animals, fungi, and protists. And even though we think the, of these organisms as being vastly different, they are not. We are very similar in a lot of ways to a plant. Outside of the eukarya, we have what we call a bacteria. A bacteria have a cell wall, which is called peptidoglycan. The bacteria, the eubacteria, the true bacteria, 
have this particular structure and those include the pathogens but a lot of the other bacteria that that are on our body that are in our environment and then last we have something called archaea um, which are called the ancient ones that uh, usually they these have kind of cell walls and membranes that are a little bit different than the bacteria a little bit more similar to the eukarya um, um, but they, they they are different and so when we look at these three d domains we would have a um, structure that looks a lot like this so this is basically a tree alive structure and that roughly about 3.5 billion years ago we had a, a a common ancestor between these and this common ancestor diverged and so just like parts of your family will go to diverge in my family we have the caps and the right men the caps go off and then the right men's do stuff and so uh, again we have here in the eukarya we had the origin of the chloroplast so we actually had some microorganisms kind of coming together in order to develop these things and so um, uh, you need to be aware of that uh, in the three domain system uh, we have ways of ident identifying these things and so in the cell type we have the prokaryotic cell types which is the uh, archaea uh, and the bacteria, these are single-celled organisms that are relatively simple. They don't have uh, very many organelles in the eukarya, in, in this case here would be the amoeba. Our cell wall, uh, again, for the archaea, uh, varies in composition, but basically there's no peptidyl glycan. In the bacteria, we have peptidyl glycan, and that's important when we talk about the gram-staining capabilities. Um, uh, Eukarya, basically, there, there are some eukaryotes that don't have cell walls at all, uh, and they are different. They are definitely not peptidyl glycan, uh, carbohydrates and proteins and other things inside their cellulose uh, walls, cell walls, and even cell, cell, cellulose. And so um, antibiotic sensitivity, we have no, we have yes, and we have no with the amoeba, and we have a number of different things in there. And so it's, it's, it's a good idea to kind of know the difference between these characteristics. The other thing that we really got to talk about is, is something that we call in biology, we call it the endosymbiotic theory. And so eukaryotes were really able to kind of um, expand their range of what they can do by actually forming a symbiosis, what we call an endosymbiotic symbiosis. And so basically what we see, we have an early cell. This early cell was some type of predator. And what we saw is this early cell was actually able to uh, probably fed on some type of bacteria, some type of uh, uh, alpha bacteria. And what, what happened is at one time, instead of eating the bacteria, what it found that is if it was able to actually capture that bacteria and have it work for it, it would do a lot more. And so we see this mitochondria and chloroplast are remnants of ancient bacteria that were taken over by this particular cell type okay and that's what allowed the cells to to evolve and we'll talk about that a number of times uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells um, um, uh, when we can compare those uh, we look at the DNA the prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells tend to have kind of smaller genomes uh, the prokaryotic cells are kind of a circular genome. The eukaryotic cells are linear. Uh, uh, eukaryotic organelles are, are linear. Uh, histones, prokaryotes don't have histones. Eukaryotic cells do. The mitochondria and chloroplasts don't have histones. So this is one of the reasons why we think that these prokaryotic and eukaryotic organelles, uh, that the uh, a, a lot of the eukaryotic organelles, organe, organelles actually came from prokaryotic cells. The next thing that we got to talk about is scientific nomenclature. Uh, what we have, the binomial genus uh, specific epithet species is used worldwide. It's always underlined, so call me out when I don't underline something. The rules for naming are set by the International Committees, the International Code of Zoological Nom Nomenclature. So you can't just call something, you actually have to have it done. And then the bacteriological code is set up by the kind of the Burgess uh, manual that we talked about. So scientific names. So we have a name like Klebsiella pneumonia. No, no. And again, this is named in, uh, in honor of Edwin Klebs. Uh, the source of this epithet is the disease. So the Klebsiella is uh, in honor of, of um, uh, Edwin Klebs, and pneumonia is the disease that it causes. We have a number of these different things here. And uh, again, a lot of these names, Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, change of the cell, strepto, form of, a form of pus, pile. And uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of these things. And, and so 
you're going to need to recognize some of these uh, microorganisms. So it's critical that you kind of look at these here. And so uh, when we define a species, sorry, I think I have my dog crying there. He wants to play with me. Uh, eukaryotic species are a group of closely related organisms that breed among themselves. And so what do we do in things like microorganisms that don't necessarily have sex? In prokaryotic species, we see a um, basically a species is a population of cells with similar characteristics. A clone is a population of cells derived from a single cell. A strain is genetically different cells within a clone. And so you may have different strains, and there's strains of E. coli that are pathogenic, uh, and some that are non-pathogenic. A culture is bas basically a term for a number of bacteria that you grow in the lab. Now, viruses actually do have their species. There are specific viruses that are in there. And so a virus species is a population of viruses with similar characteristics that occupy a particular ecological niche. Okay. Um, is it as easy to classify microbes as it is the, the macrobes, like whales and stuff like that? It's kind of hard because, again, when we look at whales, we can sell two different whales. If they don't mate with one another, if they don't produce viable offspring, then there are different species. So how do we classify things like microorganisms? And, and again, for a long time, we realized that we didn't discover bacteria for a long time. All of our history, we had no idea that bacteria were out there. Until we developed the microscope and were able to look at them, we didn't look at them. And so what we do is we have a number of different ways of identifying bacteria. Because even when we do look at them underneath the microscope, we have rods, cocci, and spirilli. And so we actually do something that's called the Gram reaction. I'm going to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about the Gram reaction to another chapter that's in there. But basically when we look at a popular, you know, when we look at different bacteria, we say, oh, what's Gram positive? What's Gram negative? When you go into a room of people, you, see, you may do like how many males do we have in here, how many females that we have in here. And so we're able to do things like look at morphology, looks at rods and cocci. We're able to look a little bit at the biochemistry in order to identify them. So in the past, we use gross morphological characteristics in order to identify bacteria. And so here, just like we showed you before, here is some of the uh, what we did. And so we have bacteria. We have the uh, non-assigned for bacteria, you know, basically kingdom, uh, the domain kingdom, uh, the proteobacteria, etc. So we have a number of these, and, and then genus species, Escherichia, and then we have the the coli for the the colonobacteria. Uh, so again, when we look at the phylogenetic relationships of the prokaryotes, and so again, we look at kind of a common ancestor, you know, and so when they have lots of characteristics in common, we think that they have a common ancestor. So you are going to look a lot like your cousin, but probably you may look a little bit less like your cousin than you do look like your brother or sister because of those sharing com common characteristics. And so again, this is looking at uh, the prokaryotes, the single-celled, uh, less complex organism. We have the bacteria and the archaea. Uh, of the more than 260 species of bacteria that have been identified so far, only about 250 of them, or roughly about 10% are pathogens. And so when you got there, most of the bacteria that you encounter are not going to be, are, are not going to care about you at all. And uh, the only reason why I think we have this number, you know, there's well over 2 million species out there that they exist. The reason why we know so many, of, uh, th so many pathogens is that we actually look for the pathogens, okay? And most of the bacteria that are out there, we kind of actually don't look for them. Uh, but, you know, at some point, does it does it really matter? Does it really matter kind of what species that are out there? And I would say yes. Yes, it does matter. So we, it's important for science sakes and for, it's important for knowledge sake that we do know what these organisms are. And so classification is placing an organism in a group of related species, list of characteristics of known organisms. And so... Uh, again, when you classify something, you're, you're putting something in a general area. In identification, you're matching the characteristics of an unknown organism to a list of known organisms. And again, what we talk about here is this is basically what we call about clinical lab identification. And so if you're a microbiologist working for a, a, a pet hospital, like you, know, like you applied for that job, or if you're a microbiologist working for a hospital clinical laboratory technician, uh, if somebody has a disease, what you may want to try and do is uh, is isolate and identify the type of microorganism that a, that a person has. And so that's very critical. Uh, one of the things that we have, a, a tool for us to help us look at this, again, is the Berge's Manual. And what the Berge's Manual set up is basically a way to identify the microorganisms. And Berge's, in Berge's it's more of a medical uh, tool because it's not there for you to kind of look at relationships of microorganisms. It's basically there to tell you what it is. 
And in Berge's manual, you're looking at the morphological characteristics. You do a gram stain on something, you say it's gram positive, gram negative, it's a rod, it's a cocci. You look at the presence of various enzymes, you look at serological tests, you can look at something called phage typing. You can look at, uh, again, in the 90s, uh, we did the fatty acid profiles. You can do DNA fingerprinting. You can sequence in ribal DNOME. And it's, it, it's relatively difficult. And it's still difficult for us to do this. And so, uh, again, in our men, uh, ident identification methods, in the morphological characteristics, uh, again, this is really identify, useful in identifying eukaryotes. So you can go out there and you see this thing that flies. Oh, that's a bird. You see this thing that's green and stays still. Oh, that's a plant. And you're looking at the gross morphological characteristics in order to identify something. Bacteria basically don't have that many different ways in order to identify them. So we do this thing that we call differential staining, where we can do a gram staining. We can tell if something's gram positive or gram negative. We can do acid fasting. There's a number of different things that we can do. Um, relatively simple tools to identify what some of these microorganisms are. We can also do biochemical tests, which determines the presence of different ba bacterial enzymes. And so, again, we can take a microorganism and we can ask it something like, does it ferment lactose? Lactose is milk sugar. So if you put it in milk sugar, will it be able to grow? Uh, no, they can use citric acid. You can do something else if it, if it can grow in milk sugar. And so things like Escherichia coli, things like Citrobacter, Enterobacter can actually use milk. Things like Salmonella, things like Shigella can't necessarily use, use milk sugar. And so it's a way for us to identify what these are. Uh, what this list here is what you'll see a lot of times when you when you uh, do uh, 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 labs in a hospital. Uh, uh, we would have these for you. And so actually at one point in your life, if you were here on campus, one of the things that we do is we give you a lab sample and you're able to identify what it is in there. And so what this lab reporters do is, is, is you know, um, you know, we don't do lab write-ups all the time for something like this. What you do is you would have a form that you'd fill out. And so in this one here, you do a gram stain. Is it gram positive? Is it gram negative? What What is it? So here, this thing is a gram negative cocci, and it's oxidase positive. So when you do all these tests, we can do these tests. And then you, as a technician, would recommend to a doctor kind of what it is. But you have to show all the data to the doctor because, again, they're responsible for looking at it as well. Uh, and so again, a species, we have something like E. coli was a species, but a species can actually have different strains. And some strains can be non-pathogenic and some strains can be uh, pathogenic. And so here is an a electron micrograph but that's been enhanced of looking at E. coli. And if you look at it, like the E. coli K12 strain that we use in the laboratory is non-pathogenic. But you may have heard of the E. coli um, uh, O139H28, which are these pathogenic strains of bacteria that we tend to see in cows that have been fed or housed in barns basically all, all their lives. So really kind of scary. And what we mean by non-pathogen is it doesn't cause a disease. What we mean by a pathogenic organism is that it can cause a disease. And so some of the ways that we have of identifying different strains uh, occur. So we can use what's called DNA hybridization. So DNA is an interesting molecule in that it will stick to itself. So what you can do is you can melt the DNA and look at how fast it, it, it recombines together. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We can do phage typing. So certain phage will kill bacteria and certain uh, other phage won't. So when you take your bacteria and produce a lawn and you put the phage on there, you can uh, look at its susceptibility. We can use something that's called the Western blot, so you could run out the proteins of that, and you can use antibodies to identify what those proteins. Uh, we have a tool that's called flow cytometry, where you can actually take a, uh, a mixture of bacteria and you could run it out one bacteria at a time. You could run a laser beam on it and kind of basically ask a question, do you have this type of molecule or don't you have this type of molecule? And we can set them out. That's a very powerful tool. And then again, what we talked about, the dichotomous key, we can use uh, morphological and we can use biochemical uh, characteristics to identify an organism. Nowadays, what's getting a lot more popular is using uh, genetics. And so we can do, this is basically looking at something, um, what we would call a DNA fingerprinting. Uh, we can look at the base composition and number of, of, of guanosine and cytosine in there. Uh, we can do RNA sequencing, we can do PCR in order to identify something. We can also do what's called uh, nucleic acid hybridization, and we can use uh, chips that contain certain um, primers on them in order to see kind of what the microorganism is. And so, uh, you know, again, we can use, so, so what do we use for classification? What do we use for identification? 
are are some of these guys. And so, and actually, all these uh, what we want what we want to do is when we classify something, we want to have what group is it in. When we identify something, you want to say what particularly is is it. Uh, fish is fluorescent institute hy hybridization, where we add a DNA probe uh, to the organism. And here, this is for S. aureus, and we can see where the S. aureus is. Uh, the Burgess manual is used to identify uh, bacteria, not to classify bacteria. We don't want to look at groups. We just not want to know what it is. We want to know how to kill it. Uh, features that uh, are used differentiate various organisms, but have little to do with the arrangement of organisms in a taxonomic group. There's four major groups. Uh, in domain bacteria, we have the gram-negative eubacteria that have cell walls, and these are called the protobacteria or the eubacteria. We have non-protobacteria, which are the gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive eubacteria and have cell walls, and we have the domain archaea. And so, uh, again, of the true bacteria, we have the gram-negatives, the gram-positives, and then the uh, gram-negatives that are, are not part of the probacteria. Some group identification that we have, uh, the spirochetes include gen uh, genus Borrelia, Lepos Leptosporia, Treponema, the aerobic microaerophilic motel-like helical vibroid gram-negative bacteria, uh, Campylobacter. And so, again, these are species that I'm telling you about that you're going to need to know. And uh, what, we're, what, what I'm telling you is that once we get this name on there, you should really look up what these organisms are and what their characteristics are. And so you have your gram-negative uh, aerobic microaerophilic rods and cocci, agrobacterium alganes, uh, pseudomonas, your facultative, facultatively anaerobic gram-negative rods, which are your genus Enterobacter, Escheratia, Klebsia, Sorella, Shigella, Eurysnia, and Echinella. Your gram-positive cocci would be Lactobacillus streptococcus, Staphylococcus. The endospore-forming gram-positive rods and cocci, genus Bacilli and Clostridium, and your regular non-sporming gram-positive rods, which uh, genus Lactobacillus and Listeria. And so these are, are grouped by identification. When we talk about it next in chapters 4 and 5, we're going to be looking at kind of classification. Uh, all these organisms, uh, again, for the, fine, uh, for the midterm, I will give you a list of these organisms and that you're going to have to describe for me a little bit about this. Uh, again, you do, may not know what Campylobacter is now, but by the end of this class, you should be, you should be able to give me a general idea of what Campylobacter is and of what ecological, what economic importance it is. That's the extent of this. We're going to be going to, on to chapter number four after this. It's been wonderful talking to you. Have a good day and identify and classify your bacteria.